All right, this is the podcast for STEM Biology, Chapter 3, Section 1 we're going to cover in this one, which is on carbon compounds. First, let's review what is a compound. A compound is defined as a substance that contains two or more elements in a fixed ratio, like H2O. However, we're going to be more concerned with um, organic compounds for this section. Um, there are two types of compounds organic compounds and inorganic compounds. The difference is organic compounds contain carbon atoms and are found in living things. Inorganic compounds do not contain carbon atoms. Carbon bonding. Um, review from chapter two a little bit, um, but if you, sh you should remember that carbon can form up to four covalent bonds with other atoms because it has four valence electrons in its outer energy level. Um, carbon atoms can form four covalent bonds with other carbon atoms as well. This bonding allows the carbon atoms to form a wide variety of simple organic compounds and very complex organic compounds. Um, this is an example. So carbon is always is going to have four bonds coming off of it. Okay, um, These lines right here are representing a covalent bond. Okay, so we're not talking about ionic bonds anymore. We're only going to be concerned with covalent bonds for this chapter. Um, carbon bonds can be in a straight chain, as you can see like this. Um, sometimes the compounds will be branched. Okay, so a little more complex. Sometimes they're in rings, like this. And with the rings, sometimes they don't even write in the carbons. You just assume, like in this simplified view of a carbon ring, that each of these little corners is a carbon. Okay, um, for carbon bonding, carbon can form single bonds right here, double bonds, and triple bonds. For a single bond, that would mean that there is one pair of electrons being shared between this carbon and this carbon. For each of these double bonds then, there are two pairs of an electrons um, being shared, and in a triple bond, there are three pairs of electrons being shared. Okay, another thing we need to talk about are functional groups. Functional groups are groups of atoms that influence the properties of molecules, and they influence the chemical reactions in which the molecules participate, if they're present or not. Um, there's four of them that you need to know. First functional group that you need to know is called a hydroxyl group. Okay, if you look at the word hydroxyl, you see hydro, which is referring to the hydrogen, and then you see the oxyl, and that is referring to the oxygen. So it is an OH group, and then here's your bond, and then there's going to be something here. Okay, um, so the functional group is called hydroxyl. The formula is a bond with an OH. Um, it's in the compound group called alcohols and so an example is ethanol which is found in alcoholic beverages um, but here in the pink is your hydroxyl group so the hydroxyl group is always bonded to something here and that can vary depending on the um, compound um, and because of the oxygen here and what we learned about oxygen last chapter is that it doesn't share those electrons nicely um, it makes all alcohols, for example, or anything that has a hydroxyl group is probably going to be polar, okay, just like water. And that means it is hydrophilic, which means it loves water. Functional group number two is carboxyl group. Carbo meaning carbon, and then you have oxygen. So the name of the functional group is carboxyl, and this is what it looks like right here. It is a carbon double bonded, it's kind of hard to see there, but that is a double bond to an oxygen. And then you also have an OH, which is a hydroxyl group attached. Notice carbon has four bonds. One, two, three, four. Um, it is in the name of the group carboxylic acids. And an example of that would be acetic acid, which is vinegar. So here's your carboxyl group. Here's your carbon double bonded to oxygen with your hydroxyl group right here. And then you have something that's what the R means. There's something here. R stands for radical. And because of the oxygens, 
this, these type of molecules will also be polar due to the unequal sharing with the oxygen. Functional group number three is an amino group. An amino group is completely different because it has a nitrogen in it. Nitrogens have um, three bonds attached to it. So in an amino group, you will have two hydrogens, and then you'll have something, again, where your R is at. So we're called an amino. That's what it looks like, the structural formula. It is in the group amines, so you might hear it as being called the amine group or amino group. And this is where we get amino acids, which we'll learn a whole bunch more about in our next section. And here is your amino group. Here's your nitrogen. Here are your two hydrogens attached. And then this is your R group. Notice the R group is, has a carboxyl group on it. Okay? So you've got your carbon double on the oxygen and OH. And then you've got your amino group here. And then within the carboxyl group, you have your hydroxyl group. So you need to be able to recognize these functional groups. The last functional group is the phosphate group. This one's easy to recognize as well because it has a phosphorus in it. Phosphorus, and it has a whole bunch of oxygens all around it. So the name is phosphate. Here is your, what it looks like. It is organic phosphates is the name of the group, and that's what it can look like in a molecule. Again, the R is always going to be different depending on what the molecule is. So those are your four functional groups. Um, large carbon molecules can be made because of the complexity of the characteristics of carbon. Um, if carbon is making a small molecule when it's bonded together, those small molecules are called monomers, which means one unit. Okay? If you take a whole bunch of the monomers, the small molecules, and you bond them together, then you'll have a polymer, which means many units. Um, large polymers are called macromolecules, and that's what we're going to cover in section two. There are, and there's four of them we'll be learning. Okay, so if this is a monomer, and this is a monomer, I can bond these two together, and I can do that by a condensation reaction. If you think of something that has condensation on it, it has water on it, right? On the outside of the glass. So water is leaving. It's being released in this reaction. So condensation reactions join monomers together to form a polymer, a bigger molecule. A condensation reaction releases water as a byproduct. And so if you look at the simplified drawing of what's going on, here's your monomer number one, here's your monomer number two, and look here's your hydrogen and here's a hydroxyl group. This H and OH bond together to form water and that gets released. And then right here is where the bond forms, and you can see that right there. So this is called a condensation reaction. The opposite, hydrolysis reaction. Hydrolysis means you are going to add water. You're splitting, lysis means split, you're splitting a bigger molecule into the two smaller molecules. And I know this diagram looks ridiculously complicated, but this is sugar, it's table sugar, and it has two sugars and actually bonded right here, okay? If we add a water molecule to this big molecule here, that actually splits this bond and breaks it apart, and that's what you need to remember, into the individual sugars. So in a hydrolysis reaction, polymers, bigger molecules, are broken down into the smaller molecules. And water is added, is used to split the polymer into the monomer. So this is the opposite of the condensation reaction. Energy in an organism, the last part we need to talk about. There is an energy molecule called ATP. And ATP, you need to know what it stands for. It stands for adenosine triphosphate. And this energy is found in your cells and it's produced in your cells. Um, it stores energy during cellular processes. It releases energy during cellular processes. And so the ATP enables organisms to function and to do work. Um, ATP is um, a molecule that has three phosphate groups. Okay, 
So this is an example, a rough diagram of what ATP looks like. Okay, and we'll learn a little bit more about it in a different chapter. But it has three phosphate groups. Okay, when it has three phosphate groups, it holds a lot of energy. Okay, actually, this bond right here is where all the energy is at. And so, if I do a hydrolysis reaction on ATP and I add water, I'm going to actually break this bond. Because remember, hydrolysis takes a big molecule and splits it into a smaller molecules. I'm actually going to break this bond, and when that happens, energy is released in the reaction. So if I have ATP, which is three phosphates, I add water to it doing a hydrolysis reaction. My molecule now is only going to have two phosphate groups. So now it is called adenosine diphosphate, and the di refers to two phosphates, or ADP. And then we have just a phosphate, inorganic phosphate group released. Okay, so we'll be learning a lot more about ATP in the future. And that finishes up section one.